Okay. Brilliant. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this evening for our webinar that we are running uh, in partnership with Lloyd and White. Um, this session is entitled uh, imp uh, Insurance Implications for a Changing Workplace. And we know that we've been receiving a lot of queries from people whose uh, situations have either changed over the last year, whether that's due to COVID or not. Um, but also we know that members are needing uh, support and um, some guidance around general issues um, at the moment and uh, was just chatting with the guys before we came on about how insurance is certainly one of those things that we perhaps uh, are all guilty of, uh, you know, looking into it when we first do it and then we just keep that rolling and perhaps don't um, always anticipate um, that we need to inform the insurers if things have changed or things that might um, need to be taken into account there. So we're going to have a look at that tonight. Um, I would like to welcome um, Ryan and Will from Lloyd and White, who will be speaking this evening. Um, thank you very much for coming along tonight, guys. We're, we're excited. We've got a, a good good number of people in tonight to um, see. They've asked me not to say how many people are on, so I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> Just two, two or three. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody here. Nobody's watching. Uh, no, um, thank you very much uh, for coming on tonight. So we, you know, our members really value it and uh, certainly value our relationship. We value our relationship with Floyd and White as well. So just some housekeeping then. What we're going to do, this is a short, sharp introduction to this area. And there's some contact details if you want to, to speak to Lloyd and White about this at the end. So the guys are going to talk for about 20 minutes. Um, there's a Q&A button at the bottom. So if you, um, uh, or, or if you swipe on your phone or what have you, if you've got questions, if I can ask you to pop them in there, I'll kind of, they'll probably come in themes, which is what normally happens when we run these things. And then I'll put them to the guys at the end. So that's the housekeeping there. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over uh, to you, Will. Perfect, thank you very much. So thanks again, guys, everyone for joining. Uh, again, I appreciate it's a late one here. Um, I've got the easy job. I'm just giving a brief introduction and talk through what we're gonna talk about, uh, introduce both of us uh, before I pass over to Ryan, if that's okay. So. Yeah, as, as Lisa said there, we've had, um, I know a lot of queries in relation to this uh, and I appreciate there's a lot of going on at the moment and it's kind of a, an ongoing feast as it were. And I know you guys are doing everything you can to see your clients at the moment. So um, from our point of view, uh, we're getting a lot of questions, especially from, from chiropractors with all the different weird and wonderful ways you're working. So we're gonna kind of try and cover as many bases as possible um, with the ones that we feel are the most relevant at least. And then again, as, as Lisa said, any questions, please far away from us. Um, real quick, a few quick things on us and Lloyd and White. So for those that don't know, um, we're an insurance broker. Um, we were established back in 1946 and we've been working with healthcare professionals uh, since about the mid 90s now. Um, we've been working alongside the British Chiropractic Association for the last 15 years or so. Um, and hopefully a lot of you are familiar with us, especially through BCA insurance services and your indemnity insurance as well. So again, we take care of all of that. Um, me and Ryan, we both work in the commercial de uh, development team, um, dealing with new inquiries generally that come to the business. And so that's everything from your, your general clinic policies, um, as well as typical queries and everything from cyber insurance, um, as well as home insurance as well, as we do kind of the whole whole range within the within the team, as it were. Um, a little bit about what we're, we're covering off. So just a real quick overview here. Um, so we've got uh, work at home, uh, oh, bear with me two seconds, guys. Um, I'm just gonna get up for, uh, right screen that would help wouldn't that uh, bear with me okay sorry guys uh, it would help if I had the right thing in front of me wouldn't it um, bear with me I'm just gonna get the right slides up uh, because that is not the right one uh, do, do, do. sorry uh, here we are. Okay. There we go. Uh, right, hopefully that's a little bit better. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. So yeah, um, what we're covering off today, so a little bit on, on, as I said, so working from home, uh, you obviously got a lot of questions as well, especially at the moment with working at different premises uh, than usual, uh, especially shared premises as well. Again, with everything going on, um, I just wanna make sure that you're aware of the kind of implications, um, what you're responsible for, what you're maybe not responsible for. Um, 
We also have added a few specific points on cyber risks at home. Again, given everything that's going on at the moment um, and a big rise in some particular areas of cyber crime as well, um, we absolutely think that's, that's definitely paramount to, to talk that through. So uh, that was smooth as ever from me. Um, I'm going to pass straight over to Ryan now, um, who will take it, take it from there. Thanks, Richard. Sure. Uh, so yeah, thanks guys. Welcome. Thanks for uh, coming in. It's been a, a later one, so hopefully you've got a rosé or a white wine open by now. Uh, so we'll jump straight in. Today's only a 20 minute session, so we won't make too long. So working from home, a few things to consider. Uh, point number one, really the main important one, if you're if being honest with you, to make sure you inform your home insurer. You need to let them know. Uh, some insurers are happy to cover businesses being run from private dwellings. Other ones will be very much against it, okay? Um, if it does invalidate your insurance, don't worry too much. There are plenty of other insurers and underwriters that will pick up that request. So it's not the be or end all. If they do say they're not going to happily accept that, many of the brokers and insurers can help you with that. Okay. Um, when you are phoning the insurer, a few things to be aware of they're going to be looking for. So things to be sort of to have to hand. Uh, security arrangements, uh, any risk assessments you've undertaken at your premises, the number of patients that will be entering the property per week a day, just give them an idea of exposure, how you're storing the money, how you're storing stock. Um, if the insurer does accept it and they are happy for you to have the business within the private dwelling, just be aware of a few restrictions they may impose. So they may restrict the property owner's liability. Okay, so trips and falls that may be recovered, may be limited to just the home side of things and won't pick up the business element. Theft may be restricted as well. Uh, and you may see an increase in excesses and in premium. Okay. So that's kind of the work. But the most important thing is speak to your insurer. Each one will have a different viewpoint on what they need to be doing for you and vice versa. Okay. Uh, decide if you want to ensure your content. So I'm sure you do want to ensure your contents because they're vital for you continuing working, but where you may have to decide whether where you ensure them. Your home insurer may decide that they're happy to put an extension on for business contents. However, Again, they may not be happy to do that much of the business. They may just say, we're happy for it to be in the venue, not covering the business entirely. Okay. In which case, you'll need to look at a clinic policy. So obviously Lloyd and White offer one, but other brokers also offer clinic policies. Um, the idea being is that it will give you comprehensive business cover along with your public liability needs, your employer's liability needs, legal expenses, and much more. Okay. And that'll be happy for you to work inside your home. Those insurers are typically okay with that as a risk. Um, this is less of an insurance point, more of a good housekeeping point. If you are going to be using your home as your practice, please try and dedicate a specific room for the patients to be seen in and try and track and, and keep a specific route in and out of the home. Um, there's a few reasons for this. One is it will help the insurer quantify the risk. And two, it will make the liability risk a lot lower. You can actually conduct a risk assessment for the room you're using, the route you're using. You'll understand what contents are going to be in terms of your personal content, are going to be in the way. You can put them away if you choose to. You've got a valuable I don't know, clock or vase, or maybe you can store that somewhere else out of the way. Um, one thing also to mention is if you do have enough space for a waiting area for patients, that's great. But I would advise that you work on a one in, one out basis. Okay? Insurers aren't overly keen on unsupervised people being in even a practice, not necessarily just in, a, in your own house. So just to limit the risk for the insurer and for yourselves as well, try and do a one in one out uh, patient basis from waiting without being supervised. Okay. If you can also consider locking that, that room. So if you can get a, a little lock lift fitted on that room, it may help with the uh, insurer being willing to ensure business contents in the property overnight. Okay. And then finally on the working from home basis, it's not just you guys, the chiropractors working from home. You may also have other staff that are working from home receptionist, admin people, accounts, depending on how big your business is. Um, so it's important that you reduce your risk and your potential for having claims for them whilst they're working from home. Okay. So if you can give them the tools to complete risk assessments, complete DSEs at their workstations, that will obviously give you the best sort of chance if there is ever an issue with them falling over and such in their own homes. It's worth noting here that employers' liability under their home policies and under your home policies does not extend to pick up business exposures, okay? That employer's liability is there typically if you've got a gardener or a window cleaner, that sort of thing. Uh, it's not there for 
if you're running a business or equally you've got people running a business for you from their dwellings okay that's where clinic insurance comes into its own because that will give you the right exposure coverage okay so moving on to you working in other people's premises uh, that's not a word uh, premise i should say uh, or various multiple locations so if you already hold clinic insurance, again, that's great, but you will need to inform the insurer that you're working at multiple locations. A uh, few reasons, the postcode might increase the risk. Um, the actual uh, way the premises is built may change the risk factors for the insurer. Um, but again, they're gonna wanna know security measures at that practice you're working out. Is the reception manned? Is there shared common areas? All of those things are gonna need to know. So if you are going into a new lease agreement for a new room you're leasing, make sure you have that information to hand when you phone the insurers, okay? Some insurers may offer you what we like to call a mobile policy. And if they do, that's the best solution for you, especially if you're working at multiple locations, because that gives you a really flexible way of working without having to keep notifying us about every single location. But again, not all insurers offer that. It's just something to be aware of, okay? On the note of mobile insurances, uh, so in terms of a mobile clinic policy, Coverage is typically more flexible, as I mentioned, but one thing you will need to be aware of is it can come with higher excesses and there will be sometimes specific endorsements about the storage of goods and how you're sort of conducting your day to day risk management. OK, uh, and one thing to be majorly aware of is that not all policies will cover for content in the back of cars. OK, so make sure you check that with the insurer before you sign up to it, because obviously, unfortunately, Cars do get broken into quite a lot. If someone sees something quite shiny, they're going to try and break in and get it. You want to make sure you're covered for that. Okay. So again, on the same note, decide if you want to ensure your contents. That's probably not the right wording for it. It's decide how you want to ensure your business content is probably a better phrase. So if you are leasing a room or leasing an area from somebody else, please be aware they will not be covering you for your contents, your legal liabilities, your public liability, or your employer's liability. Okay. So if you're going to be leasing an area, having your own patients and your own staff and your own contents in it, you need to get your own policy and make sure it's correct for you. Um, it's vital to make sure you're protected. The reason that the landlord can't ensure your liabilities or your contents is quite a long story, which I'm not going to go into now, but in short, it's because they lack the insurable interest and duty of care for your business, for your contents. Okay. So making sure you have your own policy in place is vital. Um, going back on what you previously mentioned, kind of in terms of the leasing from another premises, you may find that if you are leasing from within a health centre, that's quite common inside gyms, uh, maybe inside other people's chiropractic clinics, uh, you will find that the insurer, if it is a shared premises, may restrict the theft coverage. Okay? You may see a phrase which is called VFE, so that's insurance jargon I appreciate, but VFE stands for violent and forcible entry and or exit. And what that means is that contents are not covered for theft unless there is visible signs of a break in or break out. OK, which in shorter terms, again, means that walk in theft. So during the day, someone walks in, just takes something and walks out again. That wouldn't be covered. Okay? A lot of policies will have that restriction if you are sharing a room or sharing a premises with somebody else. If you're working with your broker and with your insurer, you can often get around this and get it removed by making the room as secure as possible. So try and get a lockable box, a lockable container, try and get the room uh, either isolated, so only you using it with your own lock and your own key for it, okay? And then lastly, on the working in different locations, it's just key to just double check with the landlord and other people that are in the building about the communal spaces, so ways, toilets, um, reception areas, things like that. Generally, the responsibility for these calls uh, shared areas is the freeholder, the landlord, um, but it is important to note if you were the one that made that common area unsafe, so you had a, a trailing cable from a laptop or a Hoover or that Amazon Prime delivery turned up, you didn't realise it was there and it's been left outside the door and someone's tripped over it, you are liable for any injuries or damages that occur in that common area if you've left that out for someone to trip over, okay? And this is where, again, like I mentioned to you, the landlord's insurance isn't going to pick that up if you're liable. Making sure you've got sufficient clinic insurance to cover you and your liabilities is key. Okay. 
So on the, the flip side of that coin, really, uh, you may be in a position where you've got clinic rooms free, you've got consulting rooms free, and you want to try and make some revenue or just sort of cover more overheads while whilst things as they are. You might be leasing rooms out to other people. I'm going to say it again, so apologies. Inform your insurer, okay? So phone your, not only your clinic insurer, if you have a separate property insurer because you own the building, it's important to notify both of them, okay? So from a clinic insurance point of view, we've already touched on those points. They're going to ask security questions. They're going to ask who's in the building, so on and so forth. From the property insurer point of view, it changes a little bit, okay? Because they want to know who's actually leasing from you. The reason they want to know that is there are certain occupations in like beauty clinics, laser clinics, sun beds, people like that that are at often declines. Um, the insurer will not work with buildings that have got those occupations in them due to fire risks or things like that. Okay, so it's really important that before you sign any lease agreement, anybody for them leasing your rooms, phone the insurer and double check they're happy with that occupation being in there. Now, of course, if it's something like a general office or a, another chiropractor, a physiotherapist, that's probably going to be okay. But it's worth double checking. Okay. The final point on that really is that even if it is a more normal occupation without the fire risk, some insurers just won't accept multi-tenure risks. By multi-tenure, we mean more than one tenant in one small area. Okay. Some insurers just don't accept that as a risk. So again, it's worth calling before you sign any lease agreements. Okay. On the note of lease agreements, again, make sure that you're checking with the tenant that they have their own insurances in place. Like I said, this is the flip side of the previous slide in terms of from the person being the tenant to now you being the, the landlord, make sure they've got their own insurances in place. You don't want to be in a position where you're caught between the patient who was injured and the person that's got no insurance and you're stuck in the middle having to pick up legal costs and such trying to defend yourself in the issue. Okay. And lastly, you may find that the tenant is using some of your contents. Okay. Appreciate chiropractic benches, they're not exactly movable, and you may also be beneficial leasing to another chiropractor because you've got a spare table or spare bench in there for them to use. Again, it's just important that you inform the contents in short of it, really. Let them know someone else is using it. They may double check the person's got experience using the benches and the chairs and stuff, but they obviously will do because they're a qualified chiropractor. I hope. Um, you may only find on that that they include high excesses or higher excesses, I should say. It may restrict things like malicious damage, but other than that, it should be fairly straightforward just to inform your insurer job. Okay. okay, so this is a bit of a change of path, so apologies for this. So one thing you may or may not be aware of is your cyber risks. The reason we mention this during this webinar is it's not necessarily related to working from a different location, but actually it is. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but cyber claims have gone up massively during the COVID pandemic. Uh, and unfortunately, cyber criminals are more active than ever before because they know they're likely to get the people they want to get at the moment. Unfortunately, your home network may or may not be as secure as your business network. Okay, It's all too easy to skip that update, to not worry about doing that Windows password change, whatever it may be. Okay, So just a few sort of housekeeping things to help you make sure your home network is secure as possible. So make sure you have up-to-date and adequate antivirus software. Um, they say you get what you pay for sometimes. Maybe the free ones aren't always as good as the ones that you pay for. I'm not recommending any by all means, but just something to be aware of. Uh, make sure it's up-to-date, like I say. Uh, make sure you've got active firewalls, and again, that they're updated. Uh, if you have got, I'm assuming you have got Wi-Fi boxes. If you have got a Wi-Fi box, make sure it's got a complex password. Don't make it as easy one, two, three, because someone could easily hack into that, of course. Um, and if you are using a VPN, some of you may not be, some of you may be using a VPN. What well, that is, in essence, is just a portal through to a different system. So you may VPN through to a server that's somewhere else in your office, for example. If you are using a VPN, please make sure they're up to date with sufficient passwords on them. And one of the major things people don't realize is that you can have unlimited attempts sometimes in these VPN portals. So in theory, if the hacker or the cyber criminal can find the portal, and it's got unlimited password attempts, they'll just keep trying and they've got software that will just keep churning through passwords and then they can get into your system that way. So try and put in then place their three to five password maximum before it locks the, the portal. Okay. Um, this one's not really a, an everyday scenario, but at the moment you may have children with you that are homeschooling. Okay. Um, 
unfortunately people are sharing PCs and laptops and tablets all the time. It's just the way we are at the moment with homeschooling. Just make sure that if they are using your laptop or your tablet and that has got work on it, just make sure they can't act any patient data or even any sort of confidential style data. If they send it to a teacher as part of a homework project they've been doing or they accidentally upload it to Facebook or something without knowing it, you then straight away got a GDPR breach and all the costs associated with that. So again, just guys be a bit vigilant whilst you're sharing PCs if you can. Okay. Um, I briefly mentioned that cybercrime's up and it is massively. Uh, recent data between May and June of 2020 shows that cybercrime was up about 31%. Uh, and of that 31%, the most common thing to happen was socially engineered crime. I'll go into what that means in a second, but what that, that spike meant was that the, the cost to the UK and to UK businesses was £2.9 million, pounds, um, which is a fairly substantial amount of money, I'm sure you can imagine, between the space of two months. Um, so as I mentioned, socially engineered crime is where a cyber criminal exploits the fact that you're not necessarily in the same room as somebody and they'll impersonate either another company, a company you may use, they may impersonate a member of staff, and then by doing that, they can convince you to make a payment, whether that be directly to them, or often we're seeing nowadays, they're actually hacking into sort of the Office 365 type portfolios, making their own email accounts that look like your accountant or look like your accounts team, pretending to be that person signing off a dual payment, and then making the payment themselves that way. Unfortunately, you don't typically know until the supplier phones you through later and says, you're going to pay that invoice or and you're like, I did pay it three weeks ago. Well, it's too late. They've already walked off with the money. OK, um, so other cyber attacks to be aware of or cyber instances, things just to be vigilant of and make aware of really um, malware attacks. So obviously malware is a software that gets into your system, clicking links, getting spam emails, things like that. OK, um, once the malware is in your system, they'll typically try and find some confidential patient data They'll try and lock that part of your system. They'll then often ask for ransom or ask for something in particular to unlock it. Um, or if you're unlucky, they'll just completely delete the data just to be spiteful, really. Um, that unfortunately has happened to. Uh, another type of cyber attack or incident is what they call fund transfer, um, which is where the hacker gains access to your banking software through online HSBC or whatever it may be, something like that. And they'll then use, once they're in the system, they'll just keep transferring money out. Um, and unless you've got notifications set up or any sort of control in your bank account, typically you won't find out until a few days later when you check your online banking and see the money's come out. Okay. Um, this list not exhaustive by all means, it's just sort of the main things we see at Lloyd and White with cyber attacks happening. Uh, and the last one is human error. Human error is unfortunately, you can have as many passwords and systems and controls as you like, but unfortunately we always look the side down on the human error front. Uh, IBM have reported consistently since about 2014 that all system security breaches are due to human error. Okay, so that's something from uploading a spreadsheet to the wrong email, uh, publishing something you shouldn't have published, even as simple as giving somebody the wrong patient file or the wrong invoices when they come and pick up their invoice from you. Okay, so that's all it's classed as a cyber incident. It hasn't always got to be hacking, it can also be something as simple as giving someone the wrong patient record. Um, the reason we mention all that is that under a cyber insurance policy, all those instances we discussed and more would be covered. Okay? Under a general clinic policy, those instances are highly unlikely to be covered. And if they are covered, it's only a very, very minimal amount of coverage. Okay? Um, again, it's not a compulsory insurance. It's something you guys to be aware of that these exposures are becoming more and more real and the chances of happening are becoming more and more and more. Um, if you haven't already, it's worth discussing cyber insurance with, with your broker, with your insurer. Um, and yeah, that's everything, guys. Whirlwind tour of uh, things to consider. And, and I'll pass back to, uh, to Lisa. Goodness me, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was brilliant, guys. Thank you. I didn't think we'd be, uh, be delving into um, GDPR breaches, but of course, of course we are. And that's uh, why um, it's really important. We've had uh, a couple of questions in, so we'll skip back from uh, cyber to start with. Um, so we've had uh, one here that is basically asking about, due to COVID, I've had to change where this person works. Um, and uh, they've got somebody at home shielding, so they can't work from home now. And they want to temporarily work from another location, so perhaps uh, somebody's garden room next door or a friend or what have you and then sort their own outdoor room out at home. 
will their cover temporarily do, do the temporary switch or do they have to look to get a different policy for that? It'll probably vary on the, the, the policy. Um, what I can say from most general clinic policies, you'll find that they'll probably have territorial limits, which typically will be anywhere in the UK. Um, however, they'll probably still have a set designated address or a set designated location that that is associated with. So um, I can't imagine that being a problem. It's going to again, depend on, on who the provider is necessarily. Um, but again, I can say from say for, I can speak from Lord and White's point of view, and as say again, if it was a, a call to us, it would be a case of well, you're covered anywhere, everywhere in the UK. Um, the, those are the territorial limits for it. Um, typically, again, if you're moving different between premises, different policies will react in different ways. Um, for example, sometimes it will cover you up to a certain amount of stuff that you can take with you outside of the premises uh, in transit somewhere else. Um, but yeah, in in essence, sorry, it's a bit of another short one. Is Give your insurer a quick call see what they say is almost certainly not going to be a problem i would imagine but um it's a case of yeah speaking to the insurer properly okay brilliant thanks right. very much uh what about home visits on that one sorry i just came in yeah so on the, the home visit front again as i mentioned in the earlier slides it's all dependent mainly on if you've got your policy set up as a mobile policy um because it will depend on if the insurer is happy for content being away from a set premises when you take contents or anything away from the premises, you increase the risk of them being lost, stolen, damaged, whatever it may be. Uh, and you also have to consider that you also increase the insurer's liability risk because you're not in a controlled environment. You could be at home with someone's dog and they've got kids running around and chances are you, you could end up injuring someone or injuring yourself a lot easier. Okay. Um, so again, it's, it's unfortunately, it sounds like the, the common answer, but it's double check with the insurer, make sure they're happy with you doing home visits but providing they're on that mobile basis or they're flexible with it, it shouldn't be a problem. Great, thanks very much. Um, we've had one come in, how are house calls covered? Now I'm assuming this is going to another person's house to give treatment, if it isn't, whoever's asked that question, if you could let me know. Is that something you guys can help with? Uh, so house calls, sorry, the question we answered before, was that about house calls? Um, no, that was about, um, oh yeah, home, yeah, home visits, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. sorry, so yeah, same thing with apply, double check with the insurer, make sure that a mobile, you've got the policy set up on a mobile basis um, with the liability side of things, just check with the insurer. So on that note, just to, to make everyone aware, really, public liability and employer's liability, typically, we'll see typically, is set up on what they call a territorial basis, as Will mentioned earlier. So on most policies that are set up in the UK, they're on a territorial limit basis. So the policy should automatically extend to some extent, but it's just good practice to inform your insurer to make sure they're aware because they may be rating the policy in a certain way, which means that if you're increasing the exposure by going to multiple locations, they need to note that on the insurer and make sure they're charging a relevant premium. Okay, thank you very much. I've uh, got another question in about garden rooms, which I think is a is a real theme, isn't it? In uh, in lockdown, we've seen it with you know various reports saying that's become a, a thing that people have gone for. Um, for garden room, would you need public liability insurance? Yeah. So uh, again, with the you can almost consider to some extent that the garden room is just an extension, obviously, of your your home, really. So um, it's making sure that your insurer that does your home policy is aware that you've got people traipsing up and down your garden potentially or if they're coming in through a side gate or coming in through the front door they need to be aware of that your home insurer will need to know to make sure they're happy with that additional exposure from a property owner's liability point of view property owner's liability differs from public liability in that the property owner's liability is your liability as a homeowner the example used to always be if a storm happened and a slate fell off your roof and hit someone's car that's your property owner's liability whereas with a business's public liability that's you as a business owner, making sure that people coming onto your, your business premises are safe from tripping over, cutting themselves, whatever it may be. Okay. Um, so that's why I say your home insurer's property owner's liability will not automatically or is unlikely to automatically extend to your business public liability. So with the garden room in, in that case, make sure the home insurers are aware, see if they're extending liability automatically. And if they are, or if they're not, it may be best place to get a clinic policy that is correctly covering your liability risks. Super. Right, well, that, that is our whistle-stop tour of absolutely everything we've, we've whizzed through there. Thank you so much. 
um, Ryan and Will, uh, for giving your time up to come along and do that this evening. Um, I hope for everybody watching and listening, that's been helpful. What's up on the screen at the moment is um, contact details there. So if you need to get hold um, of Lloyd and White, absolutely, as, as both the guys said, you know, speak to your own brokers if you're if you're not through Lloyd and White, but if you feel like you wanted to, to have a chat with um, particularly these guys, that information is there. This session has been recorded and I'll we'll share we will share the um, link uh, through in touch on Friday through our, our news sector. So if you want to rewatch it back or if you uh, say to one of your colleagues about it, they'll be able to access it that way. Um, but thank you very much, uh, guys. I wish you a fantastic evening um, and thank you very much for the Natana. 63 people that came along live uh, to watch. I think you beat Danny. You beat Danny. I think we had that as well. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that. So uh, I knew there was going to be a little bit of it in, in the house rivalry there. But um, no, thanks to, to all of you for coming on tonight to, to watch thanks and join us as well. Sure. Oh, thank you. Oh, getting lots of lovely thank you messages in on the chat. So thank you. Thank thanks, you. Guys, appreciate it. Cheers. Super. Thanks, Bye. Cheers. Thanks. Bye.